Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchmen Studios with another Watchmen video broadcast. We are in Matthew chapter 24. We're getting to a point that uh, everything I've done up until this point, I think there's a lot of agreement on amongst Bible scholars, Bible prophecy people, uh, things like that, with the exception, of course, of the Catholic Church. They probably didn't like my last series. But anyway, trying to follow the Word of God as close as I can. Now, before I get into the topic that we're going to talk about today and probably the next maybe two or three Watchmen broadcasts, uh, let me refresh my testimony for you. I have always been a student of Bible prophecy uh, growing up, loved to hear sermons on it, read, you know, the Bible and the book of Revelation, Matthew 24, different things like that concerning what was going to happen in the end times, and um, probably would have considered myself and did during my young years, teenage years, into college, a premillennial, which means I believe in a literal thousand-year reign. I do. I still do. And um, then there is a, a thing that goes before premillennial called pre-tribulational premillennial. Some people can be mid-tribulational premillennial, some post-tribulational premillennial. But anyway, we believe in a thousand-year reign. And then in 1997, uh, God led me to study Bible prophecy on an active basis. Just And if you remember, I've said this many times, I'm going, boy, I'm going to buy all these prophecy books. And God said, read the one I wrote, because it's better than everybody else's prophecy book. Wow! Thought never, and I'm being serious. I, I went, it is a book of prophecy. What I was doing is I was relying upon men's opinion of what God said rather than what God said. So, and when I say this now, understand that this is not easy, and I don't think I still have quite done it yet. I made a, a deal with God. Actually, I think he led me to it. Me saying, God, I'm going to for, try to forget everything I've ever been taught, everything I've learned, everything I thought I knew. Because if you go to God and say, God, God, I already know that. You don't need to teach me that. I already know that. I want to learn some new thing. If you do it like that, God might just say, you know what? Fine. I'm, I don't have anything to tell you. So I just said, God, help me to walk away from all my presuppositions, the things that I think I know. God, if you want me to be uh, a millennial, I'll be a millennial, which means you don't believe in a literal 1,000-year reign. And I went to Bible college with under some professors who were a millennial. Fortunately, I'm not an a millennial, but I'm also not a lot of other things either because I told God, I want to see it in your word. I want, it, I want to read it plainly. I want to be able to see it, and I want to be able to share it then word for word from your word. Now, there are thousands upon thousands of different views of Bible prophecy. And I would say that every one of them is wrong on at least one thing, because let God be true and every man a liar, and that includes me. And when it comes to this idea of a period of time called Great Tribulation, there is an ingrained thought in, I would say, most of Western non-Catholic Christianity that automatically says that's seven years, automatically. That whenever somebody says, well, you know, during the tribulation, first thing comes in our mind is seven-year tribulation. And that's the way I was. 
when I began to look in the scriptures for seven year tribulation, I could not find it. It wasn't there. How can we explain a doctrine that we say we wholeheartedly, radically believe in if we can't point somebody to the scriptures out of the mouth of two witnesses or three, if we can't point to the scriptures and say, here it says it word for word. I mean, I can tell you everything that is known about hell by taking you to the verses in the Bible that describe hell. I can teach you the doctrine of the blood atonement by taking you to all the verses in the Bible that speak of the blood atonement. I can teach you about the translation of God's people, the first resurrection, when we're caught up in the air, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are, see I'm quoting scripture now, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. I can teach you about the, the translation or the rapture by pointing you to the verses that say it, the typology that shows pictures of it, and so on and so on. What I cannot do for the life of me, what I cannot do is point to you a single scripture that tells you or tells me that a period called Great Tribulation lasts seven years. I can't do it. And I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't say that maybe I'm just dumb and don't know anything because there's enough people saying that about me already. Maybe you're doing it now. Let me show you what I mean. We're in Matthew 24. And uh, as I get into this now, and let me say this, I have friends in the ministry whom I love and deeply respect. And I would never, ever, in, in eternity, I would never try to offend any one of those guys um, directly contradict anything that they, I would never go to their church and say, you know what, your pastor is an idiot if he believes such and such. I would never do that. I treat my friends pretty good. I don't have very many of them. And I don't get into it with my friends about what we agree or disagree on. That's just a no-no with me. If guys, if I know guys believe and preach this book, they're off limits as far as I'm concerned because I believe they're God's anointed. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean that in order for us to have friendship, we have to see eye to eye on everything. That may be the rule for children, but for the grown-ups, after a while, you should learn how to get along with people without trying to prove they're wrong all the time or pointing out all their mistakes or them pointing out yours. And so to those of you who are my friends and I love you dearly and, and um, I, I want to keep our fellowship and our friendship, number one, I mean no harm in the things that I'm going to say concerning great tribulation. And if, and if, I'm, if I do anything with what I'm saying, it would be to provoke you as with anything that I do. It is to provoke you to go to the Word of God and say, Mike Hoggart is wrong, and boom, here's why. It says it right here. Because let God be true, and every man a liar. We don't know the future as well as we think we do. We believe what God said, but we're seeing through this glass darkly. I, I make a point, I make a joke, that arguing over Bible prophecy things that haven't happened yet, it's like an old couple fighting over the winnings from a lottery ticket that they haven't bought yet. They don't even know if they've got the winning ticket or not, much less have they bought it, but they're fighting about how they're going to spend the money, okay? You know, in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul said, when he's talking about the, the translation, he said, wherefore comfort one another with these words. And what do most Christians do with these words. 
beat each other over the head with them on their particular view of when the rapture occurs. So if you were to ask me, Mike, are you, you're mid-trib, right? Or you're post-trib, right? Are you pre-trib? What I think I would say is, I don't think that term applies. If you were to ask me when I think the rapture is going to be, I'll simply say at the last trump, because that's exactly the way Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 15. So Christ in Matthew 24 used this word twice. He said it in verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation. And believe it or not, I've heard people say, well, it says the great tribulation. No, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now, something interesting to me, and I think the words mean something, is that Christ spoke of a great tribulation time, and he used the word days to describe it. Not months, not years, but days, okay? You say, well, you know, you're kind of nitpicking. Maybe. Now let's look at the next, which is actually the, the reference that we're going to be dealing with in this series. This is the part we've tried to move in the order that Christ laid everything out. In Matthew 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation, and here he says it again, of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the power of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory so on both occasions christ mentioned that tribulation time in reference to days the immediately after the days of uh, the tribulation of those days, uh, except those days be shortened, no flesh should be saved, okay? So maybe I'm making too much of that, but again, if you were going to say, hey, Mike, in Matthew 24, it plainly teaches you that it's seven years, I would have to strongly disagree with you and say, it doesn't say that anywhere in the text. Now, the question you might have is, then where did it come from? Now, I don't claim to know everything about the history of the tribulation. I have done a little bit of research in it about where it stems from and so on. And I'm going to give you about as good a shot as I can with where it came from. And just so that you understand that the pre-tribulation theory says that the rapture occurs first, and before the rapture, nothing of any significance can take place. Then the rapture happens, then there's a period of seven years tribulation, where you have the beast, the false prophet, mystery of Babylon. Then at the end of that, the battle of Armageddon, Christ in Revelation 19 returns with his saints, fights the battle, throws the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire, and so on. It is the belief that there is a period of seven years in which the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials of wrath occur. This period to them is called the Great Tribulation. They believe that before this period, the church is raptured or translated, and that nothing prophesied in Scripture can occur before this seven-year period. Now, this idea of a seven-year tribulation seems, in, in my opinion, to have come from a, a teaching called dispensationalism. Now, again, I have friends in the ministry that would call themselves dispensationalists. I love these men. They're great men, godly men who 
they can read the Bible just as well as I can. So I don't, al- I don't know why sometimes we always disagree on certain things. I sort of equate it to like our body. Why did God make my left hand the exact opposite of my right hand? Well, the left hand has different things to do than the right hand, and it's not really the left hand's job to worry about what the right hand is doing, right? Isn't that scriptural? Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Left hand know what your right hand is doing. But sometimes we work pretty well together, don't we? So I'm not out to make enemies of these people that I love very dearly and respect highly in the ministry. But we just, God just makes us opposite for some reason that accomplishes and achieves His will. And I know there's people on the internet that are a lot less forgiving than I am. If you disagree with them on anything, you're a heretic, you're a false prophet, and that's just how they treat people. And I just don't see that there comes any benefit from that. But there are differences. And I have friends in the ministry who are, we call themselves dispensationalists. Now, there are two types of dispensationalists. There is the regular, ordinary Joe dispensationalist, and then there are hyper-dispensationalists. Now, I will say that hyper-dispensationalism is a big crock of baloney. It's false doctrine. It's heresy. And the people who espouse it and hold it, you're preaching a cursed gospel. Because hyper-dispensationalism, let me, let me explain dispensationalism first. This comes from a brother, pastor, that I met who described it this way, and I, and I like this. He said, we believe it is ways that God dispensed grace at different times. And I went, I can handle that because the gospel is always grace through faith. And many dispensationalists believe that doctrine, that salvation, doesn't matter if it was the salvation of Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Paul, us, or the Jews in the last days. Salvation is by grace through faith. Now, a hyper-dispensationalist says that salvation is different in each dispensation, that Noah wasn't saved by grace. He was saved by works because he had to build the ark to save himself. And yet the Bible says Noah found works in the eyes of the Lord. No, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That Abraham had a different dispensation of the gospel and Abraham was saved by proving that he would take his son and lay him on the altar and offer him as a burnt offering. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says before Abraham ever did that, that Abram believed God and God counted it to him for righteousness. That's Genesis 15. So anybody who, and I've read doctrinal statements from hyper-dispensational churches. And man, I'm telling you, here's here's why they don't accept anything that I'm going to say. According to a hyper-dispensationalist, Let me get it right here. Titus Philemon. Okay, we're going to hold the Bible here, and we're going to go to Romans. According to hyper-dispensationalism, this is the Bible. This right here, I've got to throw Titus in there, in Philemon. According to hyper-dispensationalism, this is the Bible right here. This is it. This is the Word of God for us in this dispensation. They only get their doctrinal ideas from the writings of Paul, period. Period. That's it. Not Acts, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, not Hebrews, not Peter, not John, not Revelation, 
and definitely not the Old Testament. Now, they say they believe it, but they believe it's not for us in this dispensation, only this part right here of the Bible. So and here's what I think that is. We have a doctrine that says such and such, but that doctrine is basically refuted, let's say, in Hebrews. So let's take Hebrews out of what we call where we get our doctrine from. Let's take Hebrews out. Let's just cut it out of the Bible. Now our doctrine is still right. There's nothing to refute it because Hebrews isn't for us. It's for Israel. Then they ask you, why, how come you weren't in church last week? Well, what do you mean? Well, Hebrews 10.25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Wait a minute, I thought you didn't get... And I, one church I read, and I'm not kidding you, said that we hold to the teachings of Paul only, not Jesus, not Peter, not the Old Testament, which means we do not water baptize, and we do not believe God chastens us as sons. And I went, well, I know the, who they are then. They're bastards, according to Hebrews chapter 12. Did not Paul say that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works? Is it not that we get all of our doctrine from all of the Scripture instead of just the parts that we like? Okay? So those guys, I show no mercy on them. But those who would believe in dispensations of grace, okay, I can kind of, I can go along with that, all right? So don't take anything I say when I say dispensationalism that I'm painting it all with a broad brush because I'm not. I know the difference, okay? Now, one of the big books that teaches dispensationalism is a book, here it is, Dispensational Truth or God's Plan and Purpose in the Ages by Clarence Larkin. Now, I have a copy of this book, and I've read large, I haven't read it all, but I've read large seg segments of it. Clarence Larkin um, says in the, in the beginning of his book that he didn't understand Bible prophecy until he read some other books that were, had been given to him or some books that he had found, and he doesn't actually name the books. Clarence Larkin lived right around the early 1900s and was a Baptist minister, and he wrote basically the guidebook of dispensationalism. And there are a lot of churches who hold classes teaching dispensationalism out of Clarence Larkin's book called Dispensational Truth. And, but Clarence admitted that the ideas of his, his, his brand of dispensationalism did not all come from the Bible. And I will note, and I've seen this, that in places where Clarence Larkin didn't get what he wanted from the King James Bible. He didn't have a problem with going to the revised version at all to find what he was looking for, and he did that several times. Now, to me, if I have a King James Bible church and we only use the King James, I don't teach people out of books that don't use only the King James Bible. And I don't allow my teachers, my Sunday school teachers, to do that either. I don't allow preachers behind my pulpit that I don't know if they believe the King James or not, that possibly they might bring another translation into my church. I just wouldn't let that happen. And why they let Clarence Larkin be taught in their churches when several times he quotes from another translation of the Bible instead of the King James. I just don't understand. But Clarence Larkin came at a time during the um, late 1800s where 
there was a large amount of books and preachings and teachings teaching on dispensations, that God has different time eras where he did a different work among people. We happen to be in the dispensation of the church age, so God is doing a different work with us than he did in the previous dispensation and a different work than he's doing that he's going to do in the next dispensation. Here's and you can find these online. Here's one called The Harmony of the Divine Dispensation, being a series of discourses on select portions of the Holy Scripture. Here's another one, lectures on the principal evidences and the several dispensations of the revealed religion. Here's one written by GBM Clouser called Dispensations and Ages of Scripture, a study of the divine plan for the age times. And of course, dispensationalists love charts. They love their charts. They spread their charts out and they have everything that God is going to do all plotted out, charted out one by one. This is exactly how God's going to do it. There was something that struck me about the title of this particular book, Dispensations and Ages of Scripture, a study of the divine plan for the age times. Very similar to Clarence Larkin's God's plan and purpose in the ages. Here's another one. Now, this guy, Charles Piazzi Smith, did a study of the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid fascinated Europeans and especially British scholars. Great Britain sent, I don't know how many people, from Oxford and Cambridge and all these universities and archaeologists and ministers to Egypt to study the Great Pyramid. And notice that the title of, of Smith's book, Our Inheritance, The Great Pyramid. And he has some drawings in here that show, uh, basically he was trying to prove that the Great Pyramid was on the geographical center of the earth. In other words, if you put all the land masses of the earth together, that the Great Pyramid supposedly, allegedly, would be in the exact center or the what's called the axis mundi the center of the earth or the navel of the earth. And that was the point that he was trying to prove. And Charles Smith in this book basically was trying to show that the pyramid was a monument to God and built into that monument was the secret of how God was going to work throughout all of the ages of time. Okay? This was... I'm going to say around, well, let's see, it gives the date 1874, okay? So hang on to that for a second. Here's another book written after that by Joseph Seiss, A Miracle in Stone or the Great Pyramid of Egypt. And here's what Seiss says, and he's, he's read Smith's book on the Great Pyramid and how the Great Pyramid supposedly shows God's plan throughout history. Here's what he said, the pyramid and the Christian dispensation. And this sublime testimony to the great pyramid from without is also fully sustained by its own testimony from within. We have seen in a former lecture how grandly it symbolizes the truths of nature. Let us glance now at its symbolizations of grace. And so, Seiss here in his book basically shows you in some weird way that the design, the chambers, the steps, the way it's aligned and everything shows you that God works in dispensations. He works differently at different times throughout Earth's history and Earth's future, which inspired another writer to write a book called The Divine Plan of the Ages, A Helping Hand for Bible students. Now notice you even have an Egyptian symbol on this book, the winged solar disk. Do you know where that image comes from? 
Egypt. Now take a look again at the title of this, The Divine Plan of the Ages. Remember we go back up here to Clauser's book, Dispensations and the Ages of Scripture, a study of the divine plan for the age times. Pretty close, isn't it? Do you know who the author of the divine plan of the ages was? Charles Taze Russell, the founder of the Jehovah's Witness cult. And guess what? Charles Taze Russell, take a look. This is from his book, The Divine Plan of the Ages. Taze Russell was a pyramid dispensationalist that borrowed from Smith and Sice, read their books, and decided that God had different plans at different times and different dispensations for different people. And Charles Taze Russell, of course, eliminated hell because he didn't believe in it. He listened to a sermon in a church about hell, decided that wasn't God, that's too mean. So he just wiped hell out of the Bible and didn't believe it and started his own cult. And the Jehovah's Witness are a cult believing in dispensations. Now, I again, I don't know what books Clarence Larkin read, but we've seen several now that all have things in common. They believe in dispensations. They believe that the Great Pyramid somehow, some way, reveals all these dispensations and that the Great Pyramid was a monument built for God. They believe it's the altar from Isaiah 19, which I say, no way, Jose. God had nothing to do with that. God didn't build that, and God didn't instruct anybody to build it either. And then I've seen some people, hyper-dispensationalists, draw New Jerusalem coming down from heaven as a pyramid. Are you crazy? Excuse me, doesn't the King James say that that city is built for square, like this, not like this. There's a diff my geometry, my teacher in third grade told me the difference between a triangle and a square. This is from Russell's book, The Divine Plan of the Ages. He was a dispensationalist. This also from Charles Taze Russell's book, The Divine Plan of the Ages. Do you recognize the maps up here? where he shows the Great Pyramid as the center of the earth. That came from Charles Piazzi Smith's book, Our Inheritance, The Great Pyramid. Both of them, they all believe that the Great Pyramid was some kind of prophetic instrument from God. And he also has drawn in here into his book, these worlds or these ages or these dispensations. In fact, Charles Taze Russell was so enamored or overpowered with this spirit of the pyramid that he left instructions that when he died, his tombstone was to be, guess what? A pyramid. Because he believed that was the monument of God showing the dispensations. Now we bring ourselves to Clarence Larkin and dispensational truth. Clarence, in fact, here's the, the full title of his book, Dispensational Truth or God's Plan and Purpose in the Ages. Compare that to Charles Taze Russell's The Divine Plan of the Ages. And oh, by the way, Clarence Larkin, after he wrote his first edition of Dispensational Truth, got into that whole pyramid scheme, and when he had published the second edition of his book, he included an entire section on, guess what? How the Great Pyramid shows that God works differently in different dispensations. In chapter 32 of his book, Dispensational Teaching of the Great Pyramid. So now I'm gonna show you a comparison between Charles Taze Russell's book, The Divine Plan of the Ages, and Clarence Larkin's book, 
dispensational truth, God's plan and purpose for the ages. They're using the exact same maps and charts that were not drawn by either one of those. They came from Piazzi Smith. Okay? So if I, if just looking at it, it doesn't appear to me that Larkin got his ideas solely from Scripture. He read other books on dispensationalism and dispensations and pyramids and then wrapped his ideas about the second coming around that to make it form and conform and fit into that mold. Here's another comparison between Larkin's dispensational truth and Charles Taze Russell's divine plan of the ages, both of them drawing out their little dispensations. And by the way, according to them, there's seven dispensations, one of which, let me show you where it is. I want you to get a Bible out for this. I want you to get a Bible out you can pause the video if you want and go get a Bible. And then I want you to look at the page that has Genesis 1-1 on it. Okay? Now, look very closely between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Look very carefully down in there. If you look really closely, there is a dispensation between those two verses. It's called the pre-Adamic dispensation. They believe that in verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and that God created it and let Satan rule all over it, and it had angels on it, and Satan went bad, and the whole thing just was destroyed and made bad. Satan destroyed all of that world, and God had to start all over again. And Clarence Larkin actually says in Dispensational Truth that Genesis 1 is not the creation week, it's the recreation week. I can show it to you. You look it up for yourself. But they believe there's a whole dispensation here between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. In Genesis 1-2, the King James says, and the earth was without form and void. And here comes one of those places where Larkin couldn't find what he wanted out of the King James. The earth was without form and void. So he quoted from the revised version, the earth became without form and void. Because that's what they believed. They believe that a pre-Adamic race inherited the earth between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, destroyed it, and so in Genesis 1-2, God had to, it became without form and void, and so God had to redo it all over again. And Larkin believes that. Where did he get it from? I have no idea because it's not in any place in this Bible anywhere. Anywhere. Here's another one. Clarence Larkin, Description of the Great Pyramid. Same thing that Charles Taze Russell did. They used Sice's teaching. They used Piazza Smith's teaching on the Great Pyramid and dispensations and basically just copied from from those sources and maybe other sources that I don't know about, about how the Great Pyramid is some great monument that shows us the different dispensations. Now, let me get to where I'm going with this. In Dispen Clarence Larkin's Dispensational Truth, here we have his picture of called Daniel's 70th week. Notice that he says, the tribulation. So, the idea of a seven-year tribulation comes from what Larkin and a lot of other people say is a 70th week from the book of Daniel, chapter 9. And we're going to discuss that. 
Here's what Larkin said in his book, in Dispensational Truth. The expression 70 weeks should read 77s. Stop right here. Now I'll go back to the years in the ministry when I was preaching out of a King James but didn't want to. And I was pastoring a little church, and my wife used to chew me out on this all the time. Quit giving them Greek and Hebrew lessons. They don't understand that. Why don't you just preach out of the Bible? And I got mad at her. Because what I did was, I wanted to show that I was smarter than everybody in the church because I knew some Greek. I knew how to read Greek, and I knew how to look up words in a lexicon. And I deliberately, I'm telling you, I deliberately came up with off-the-wall meanings of some Greek word in Strong's Concordance in order for my people in my church to think that they wouldn't get this if they hadn't heard it from me. I'm telling you, that's how evil I was back then. Why God had mercy on me, I'll never know, but I'm glad he did. So I recognize when a guy says, now, this is a poor translation, it actually should read this way. And what you're saying is, is that this Bible is mistaken. Not in the Hebrew, not in the Greek, in the translation. That there's something wrong in our Bibles. It, what, it's like the earth was without form or the earth became without form. You see the difference when you decide you can change the Bible, you can invent whole doctrines after that. So Larkin did it. He said the expression 70 weeks is wrong. It should read 77s. In other words, 70 periods of seven years. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9 and understand this. Daniel chapter 9 is where this is all coming from, and here's what it says. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression. And there's seven things here, which I think is cool to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Seven things there. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem under the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. See? Seven-year tribulation. Now, I'm being sarcastic. But you didn't read anywhere in here about a seven-year tribulation. They say that the weeks are weeks of years. However, it doesn't say that anywhere in the text, does it? It doesn't say it. And I, I understand that I'm, I'm going out there with this. I've, I've not talked about this a whole lot. And some people are going to think I'm crazy. They're going to call me a heretic. I believe every word in this Bible every word. I don't understand every word in this Bible, but I believe it exactly the way it's written. And I just don't see where I have permission to say 70 weeks of years or 70 sevens, because I don't believe that you should change the Bible to fit your doctrine. You should change your doctrine to fit the Bible. That's what I've tried to do since 1997, is change what I believed to conform to God's Word. Now, 
concerning what Larkin said, where he said this, the expression 70 weeks should read 77s. He's saying it should read that because he wants it to read that way, because it matches then his doctrine and he's not wrong. But you can do this if you want to. Go to blueletterbible.org, type in the word week or weeks, and you'll get a Hebrew word called Shabua. I'm not speaking Hebrew very well. And I just have up on the screen a list of the places where the word Shabua is found. Genesis 29, 27, fulfill her week. Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. Thou shalt observe the feast of weeks. Uh, Leviticus 12, 5, if she bear a maid child, then she shall be unclean two weeks. Now, when you say two weeks to somebody, how long is it? Is it 14 years? Or is it a fortnight for our British friends? Two weeks is 14 days. And every other place, Numbers 28, Deuteronomy 16, seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Seven weeks, that'd be 49 days. That's how they, the Jews literally counted the Feast of Pentecost based upon Deuteronomy 16, 9, seven weeks shalt thou count. Seven times seven is 49, so 49 days. And on the 50th day was the day of Pentecost. That's why they call it Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit knew that it was 49 days plus the one day, the 50th day, because the Holy Spirit came upon Peter and the disciples on the day of Pentecost. He didn't wait 50 years to do it. He did it in 50 days exactly the way the Bible says. And then we find, there, there it is in Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks. So, so far, if I, if I don't read any of Clarence Larkin's books, Sice's books, Piazzi Smith's books, if I don't read anybody's books and I see 70 weeks here, what am I supposed to think? 70 weeks. Now, the first place the word week shows up in the Bible is in Genesis 29, 27, fulfill her week. Because I've brought this subject up before, and I said, what if, just, you know, on a wild guess, what if the 70 weeks aren't 70 weeks of years, 490 years? What if they're 70 weeks? And I said, I don't find in the text, in the context here, remember I tell you, walk circumspectly, read a place in the Bible and look at before it and after it, and then walk around the whole Bible to see what the Bible says about that. And some people wrote in and said, well, you know, pastor, uh, remember when um, uh, Laban made Jacob marry Leah first? See, the deal was he told Laban he wanted Rachel and I'll work seven years. So he worked seven years. The Bible makes it very plain, not, it didn't say seven weeks. He said, I'll work seven years. He didn't say, I'll work a week. I'll work seven years. So he worked seven years. The wedding night, you know, they're drinking a little bit. He goes into the tent. Next morning, he realizes it's not Rachel, it's Leah. So let's read what it says. Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah his daughter and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zilpah his maid for an handmaid. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. Uh-oh. And he said to Laban, What is this thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, which that's the Hebrew word, Shabua. Fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. And some people have said, when he said fulfill her week, 
he meant seven years, that he had to work seven years, and then he could get Rachel. But let's go back and read this again, and you'll find out that Jacob didn't have to wait another seven years before he could marry Rachel. He fulfilled a week with Leah, seven days, then married Rachel, and then worked seven more years. Don't believe me? Let's read it. Verse 27 again, fulfill her week and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve me with yet seven other years. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week and he gave him Rachel, his daughter, to wife also. Now in verse 30, and he went in also under Rachel and he loved also Rachel more than Leah and served with him yet seven other years. So not even in this passage does a week mean seven years. It doesn't. It, mean, it meant seven days. He ended up with Leah. He had already worked seven years. He ended up with Leah. Laban said, our tradition. Laban was just trying to get rid of this ugly daughter, right? I mean, we get that. So he gives her, he says, fulfill your week with her. Then you can have Rachel. So Jacob fulfills a week of marriage with Leah. And at the end of the seven days, he takes Rachel to be his wife and goes in under her. And then he works. It says that he served with him yet seven other years. So the week here doesn't even mean seven years. Not there. Then we find out if we go back to Daniel 9 that God meant exactly what he said in that chapter. Remember, Daniel 9 is where we find out about the 70 weeks. And the explanation is, is that all of those weeks of years have been fulfilled with the exception of one final week of years. Hence, seven-year tribulation. That's where they get it from. Now, again, did we read that plainly out of Scripture? No. Does God mean something other than what he said and just doesn't tell us? No. Because in Daniel 9, Daniel starts out Daniel 9 with this. In verse 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And so what Daniel was doing was he was, he was in Babylonian captivity. He had been taken with everybody else. And he misses home, and he's like, are we ever going to get to go back home? Is God so angry with us now that we're never going to get our homeland back? And he does what I tell you to do, what I have to do myself when we're down, when we're depressed, when we're low, to seek out God for answers. And he opens up, and he's reading Jeremiah. And the prophet Jeremiah, God told Jeremiah word for word, I'm going to send them to Babylonian captivity, and I'm going to do it for exactly 70 years. And so Daniel said that. I read Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, what did he mean by 70 years? Did he mean, you know, years of weeks? No. Or weeks of years? No. It was exactly 70 years. So God is spot on perfect here. And it was exactly 70 years. God had told Jeremiah beforehand how long it would be. Daniel read it during the 70 years, and he feels good now because God's only going to do this 70 years. And at the end of 70 years, we're done. We're going to go back home. So God meant exactly what he said in Daniel 9. And again, I find no place in the scriptures anywhere where you're going to find 
seven years of tribulation, seven years of great tribulation, not even in Daniel 9 in this 70th week can you really make out a week to be seven years. It's not supported by the text. It's not supported by the context. And it's not mentioned any other place in the Bible. So again, our rules are out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So if I'm going to believe a doctor, and you want me to believe this, you want me to, to be on your side on this, I know, you've sent me emails. Some of you were nice about it. Some of you were not very nice about it. You want me to be on your side on this issue. You want me to agree with you. If you want me to agree with you, you're going to have to present me with scriptures. Not a stack of books written by dispensationalists, because I won't read them. I won't. Why, and why do I have to? None of those guys who wrote those books were named Paul, Matthew, Isaiah, or Moses. So if I'm going to get my doctrine and my eschatology, I'm going to get it from this book, or I'm just not going to get it. Now, one more, one more argument on this, okay? Let's go back to Matthew 24. The idea is, according to them, that there's a seven-year great tribulation. And before that tribulation, here's what kicks it off. The rapture kicks off the, the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation. Once the rapture starts, God starts, he hands the book to Jesus, he opens the seals, and then the trumpets are blown, the seven trumpets are blown, and then the seven vials of wrath are poured out, and at the end of the seven years, Jesus comes down from heaven with ten thousands of his saints, and he destroys all the armies at the battle of Armageddon, and he casts all those people into the lake of fire, and then he establishes his kingdom for a thousand years on the earth. Okay, right? See, I mean, I, that's what I used to believe. I, I've studied it. I know it. That's how it's supposed to end. But let's go back to Matthew 24 and read what Jesus said about what happens after the tribulation. And let's just, for now, let's just pretend that it's supposed to be seven years. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So according to the seven-year tribulation theory, according to this, the sun is darkened, the moon doesn't give her light, and the stars fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens are all shaken at the end of the seven-year tribulation, correct? But that's not when those events happen. In Revelation chapter 6, we have the opening of the sixth seal. And at the opening of the sixth seal, see, after the sixth seal, you have the seventh seal to be opened, which initiates the seven trumpets, and when the seventh trumpet is blown, that initiates the seven vials of wrath. So, if at the end of the seven-year tribulation, the sun is darkened, and the moon doesn't give her light, and the stars of heaven fall, and the powers of heaven are shaken, and that's supposed to be the end of the seven-year tribulation, why then is that event happening at the sixth seal? Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. 
and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now, if I were to go to the book of Revelation, at, let's say, the, the appearing of Christ in Revelation 19, as he's coming down from heaven, you know, he's got his name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he is uh, the Word of God, and he has ten thousands of his saints with him. I find absolutely nothing in any of the poured out vials of wrath or the coming of Christ himself in Revelation 19. I find absolutely no mention of the sun being darkened, the moon not giving her light, the powers of the heavens shaken, and the stars falling to the earth. That happens back in Revelation 6 at the opening of the sixth seal. You see what I'm saying? They don't match. They don't add up. If as hyper-dispensationalists say, we don't get our doctrine from Jesus. Yeah, they actually say that. That the four Gospels are not written for us. They're written for Israel. So we're not supposed to get any of our doctrine from the four Gospels. That's for the Jews. I just don't, I can't understand how these two events are supposed to match up because I don't believe they do. And if they don't add up and I can't see it written plainly on tables, then I can't believe it and I won't believe it until I see it written plainly in the scriptures. Now again, I'm not trying to upset anybody's apple cart, nor do I think I have some new private interpretation of scripture, nor do I think that I'm the smartest guy in the world, because I know I'm not. But I just want to believe the book the way it was written and not add anything to it that's not there and certainly not take anything away from it that's not there either. So, instead of when I read Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. What I see coming directly after that is verse 30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Where are we supposed to meet Jesus? According to 1 Thessalonians, in the clouds. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Well, what did Paul say in 1 Thessalonians 4? That the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And clearly, clearly, in Revelation, when Jesus is coming to establish his kingdom for a thousand years, there's no trumpets sounding at that time. None. Um, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. I'll tell you what you do. Get the Pure Bible Search software. Type in the word elect and then put an asterisk right next to the T in elect. That's going to give you elect, election, okay? All the forms of the word elect. 
and read every verse and find out who is called God's elect. I can give you one right now. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Now, is that Paul talking about only the Jews? Or is he not also talking about us? That's what I believe. Do I have a time frame for it? No. Not really. I just know that God's going to shorten those days for the elect's sake. Now, again... If, I'll, if all I've done, if, if I've upset you, I, I, am, I really am sorry. I, I don't want to. But if I can provoke you then to search the Scriptures and do what the Bereans did, to see whether what I said today is true or not. I didn't say go read a bunch of stacks of books. If I can provoke you to read and study the scriptures, for you to show yourself whether or not there is a seven year tribulation, not wrath, tribulation, then neither one of us lose because I'm reading the Bible and you're reading the Bible. And isn't that what we're supposed to be doing to begin with? Reading our Bibles, studying our Bibles. Study it. Learn from it, take from it, and hold fast that which is good. And test the spirits. God does not have a problem with you asking questions. That's the devil who doesn't want you asking questions, all right? I want you to know I love you. I love you enough to tell you this is what I see in God's Word. And to tell you also this is what I cannot find in God's Word. So maybe you can have better success at finding it than I did. And if you find a seven-year tribulation in the Bible, write me. Because I would sure like to say, I would, I would get in front of this camera and say, I was wrong. There it is in black and white. Okay? God bless you. I love you. You're the reason why I do what I do. Study your Bible. Study to show yourself approved, not to me, but unto God. And then we'll talk next week about whether or not us saints, Christians, believers, should ever have to endure any type of tribulation. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.